uh, leave the floor to the, the, the main speaker of the of the day. Uh, and my first question is a really simple one. What I would like uh, uh, Donna, Lorena and Emma to, to, to do first is to introduce themselves. So, uh, and I ask them to do, do that in terms of career uh, path so far and also showing up the different transition that you uh, you had your current job also the company in which you you work and if you also could share the main skills that you developed as a um, as a phd candidate or postdoctoral fellow that you still use in your current job and the one you had to develop so it will it's a wide question but it's really to 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 start the discussion uh who would like to start otherwise i will decide <laughs> uh, i can start if you if you want to do you hear me yes, yes. emma thanks a lot emma <laughs> you're welcome uh, so I had a very classical uh, parkour in France. Uh, I did a license in Grenoble, a uh, biochemistry license, and then I came to Paris to do my master degree. And right after I did a PhD at the Pasteur Institute. Um, so I did three years of PhD uh, working on mitochondria biology. And right away I uh, switched to industry, so I joined the Gourmet. Uh, which is a startup which was quite young at the uh, when I joined we were only 10 people so it was really the beginning and um, so what skills did I transfer basically I think I transferred everything because when you join a startup knowledge is really precious so everything you learn before you can apply it uh, so everything you learn in the lab all the techniques uh, for example uh, I will RTQPCR, I mean fax, uh, every technique you can learn, uh, you can apply later. And it's always, even if you don't apply, it's always good to have seen it and just to know what you're talking about. Uh, everything about project management, uh, because when you're a PhD, you, you have your own project. So you have to learn how to manage it in terms of, of timeline. Um, you have a PhD, like you have a number of years, so you know, you basically know how to manage a project. So everything about that, also uh, every skills uh, collaborating with people you already know about it, uh, you're working in a team. Uh, I mean, everything you can learn during your PhD will be useful after for me, <laughs> at least from, from my experience. Uh, and I think, did I forget something? Well, maybe you can say a bit more about Gourmet because I'm not sure yeah. everybody in the audience is familiar. They should, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a cu cultivated meat company. So what we want to do is uh, foie gras, uh, do foie gras uh, that is uh, without uh, killing animals and uh, in a more environmental uh, uh, friendly way, let's say. Uh, so yeah, we, we have a first project with, with, which will be foie gras and uh, more to come. Thanks a lot. Uh, do you, Duna, do you want to, to be the next? You are smiling a lot, so I, <laughs> I consider <laughs> sure, it I as a yes. Sure, I would be happy to. <laughs> so I, would, I want to thank you to, to giving me a space to speak uh, to all the pastorians. It's always a pleasure to come back. Mm, well, my maybe my, my path was a bit more complicated than Emma. I have done my PhD in biochemistry biophysics at Paris Descartes, and uh, after that, I have done four postdocs. So please don't judge. <laughs> one of uh, one of them was uh, was at Pasteur Institute, and uh, the fact that I worked closely with uh, the mask helped me to create my LinkedIn uh, page in a more comprehensive way. And that's uh, how the founders of Neoplans, where I'm working now, uh, uh, found me. Uh, so uh, Neoplans, you are a company that you are creating plants uh, that are able to purify indoor air, uh, and uh, I. I am a biochemist, so I started by joining uh, Neoplant as a senior scientist, where I applied all the technique of uh, the, all, all my technical skills of uh, protein purification and um, evolution to uh, give this capacity to plants uh, to be able to purify indoor air. Uh, after that, like I joined Neoplant uh, almost four years ago, so I was uh, their first employee. 
And uh, now I'm head of innovation at Neoplan. So I'm um, learning more and more about uh, management and people management. And that's where I got coaching and I had to work on my like soft skills uh, to be able to embrace this new role. We are not hearing you. Oh, yes. I, I, I was saying uh, it's amazing how fast you could evolve. This is also something we see a lot in uh, in startup company. Uh, in totally. Uh, Lorena, you are also in a startup, but I'm not sure we can still call it a startup, a unicorn. Yes, exactly. At least. It's a unicorn. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, evolving a little bit. So, well, I have started my professional career uh, studying biology. I did all my studies in Mexico in the National University. Uh, so first I was very interested on the fundamental science. So uh, I don't know, my thesis was on protein evolution and these kind of things. And, and as I was um, advancing on, on these studies and, and uh, started my, my master and PhD, I uh, saw that I really wanted to do uh, more uh, applied science. So I uh, started with some projects uh, mainly related to biotechnology and health. Uh, a uh, lot with enzymology, biodegradation of pesticides, etc. Uh, but at one point, I, I, I thought I, I need something a little bit more concrete. Let's say uh, for me, it was it was really nice to publish and to go to conferences and everything. But I really wanted something uh, that my work translated into something a little bit more tangible. Um, let's say so I started I had a moment when I finished my PhD in which I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I know that I wanted to explore a little bit something outside uh, the, the academia. So I found a, a job, I think, for, for six months that was a project that was uh, uh, between government and academia. So it was already um, a little bit different. And there I, it was really interesting because at first, uh, you know, you are in university, you are always, let's say, uh, dealing uh, with teams of scientists like that think more or less. Uh, how you how like you and sometimes to get out of this comfort zone let's say and start uh, collaborating with government and well the Mexican government sometimes it's not that easy so it was a really nice really interesting experience let's say um, after I did like a small uh, postdoc in a in a lab group that was really uh, close to uh, collaborating with the pharma industry. Uh, and then I started postulating uh, to see what I can do in industry. And uh, I found uh, Insect that at the time in 2015 was a startup. So I decided to, to come to France. Uh, we were as well, I don't know, like 15, 20 people. Uh, now we are around 250, so it has uh, evolved uh, during uh, these eight years that I have been uh, in industry. Um, so, well, insect for for the people that do not know us, uh, we are rearing and transforming insects uh, for developing ingredients for uh, animal, human, and plant nutrition and health. Uh, so right now I am a scientific project manager, so let's say uh, involved in the networking and uh, launching a lot of trials in, to valorize our ingredients. Uh, and well, with some other projects uh, on international development and uh, so started from being the scientist more in the enzymology part to going to process and, and development to uh, this part of valorization and working a lot with the marketing team that uh, that I enjoy a lot. Uh, so the skills, um, I think, well, we all know that that in the in the PhD, you develop this capacity to find information to also propose uh, projects to generate ideas. Uh, you you give uh, I think the PhDs in the company we give uh, like a critical view, uh, an opinion 
in, in several as, aspects. And also, I think the the thing that was interesting developing during uh, the postgraduate studies was the communication skills. So uh, even uh, written or orally uh, that are important, uh, let's say, for a company to uh, valorize what, what it has. And the things that, that I have acquired, let's say, with, with experience of working at industry is um, more on the management, the management of, of a team that I had the opportunity to, to manage a team of engineers and, and some technicians at one point. Um, to work more cross function, more cross functionality, let's say, because before in the PhD, you you yeah you work with different people, but all of them are scientists, biochemists, biologists, and here is to to work with people I don't know in the legal team, in the in the IP, with engineers, uh, with marketing, business development, so. I think uh, that's uh, interesting as well uh, to be more flexible and adaptable because not always you have to uh, sometimes do things uh, not as perfectionist as we would like, like we were doing in the in the in our PhD studies. Um, so sometimes you have to do it a little bit quick and dirty. Um, and to be yeah, flexible because the the, the company uh, the strategy can change, uh, so you have to adapt and do not be frustrated about that. And yeah, in terms of the communication, also to adapt the speech when you are talking to I don't know the clients is different than if you are talking with uh, with a scientist, uh, for instance. So that's from my side. Well, uh, since you mentioned that you have many, many internal collaborations with the different department of the, the, the company, um, do, do you have internally inside insect PhDs only in the R&D department or also in the IP regulatory and so on uh, departments that you mentioned before? Yes, so that was uh, something at least that I was trying to, to make uh, today. Uh, about my colleagues that are PhDs, science uh, PhDs, and uh, no, well, of course, we are a little bit more in the R&D department, but the head of the regulatory, it has a PhD. Uh, my boss that is in sales and business development, he has a PhD at base. Um, the IP and financing, uh, and research financing director also has a PhD. People in the engineering team as well. So it's not only in the in the R and D departments that PhDs are found. <laughs> Thanks for, for sh sharing this insight because uh, well today you are more into R and D, the three of you, and uh, it, it's also because it's most of the time the the entry point uh, but then what we see is that the, the the PhDs can definitely transition to other department within the company and do, do you currently hire PhDs uh, at insects because at insect? we yeah. may have an audience who is looking for jobs right now <laughs> yeah unfortunately we are not uh, hiring uh, PhDs for the moment uh, we are concentrating a little bit more on the uh, launching the factory so uh, for me, the moment no but but you never know when something will come up <laughs> Great. Well, we are hiring phds question. now uh, so oh. if you are interested just go to neoplans website so there we have several positions for phds so could, could, could you comment on the, the kind of positions that are open to PhD at Neo plants? We have in chemistry, plant transformation, uh, biochemistry. So we have several positions that are open now and like uh, all of them are available on our website. I don't have them all in mind. Oh, I hope it's well noted on your side. Uh, I've shared the website of Neo plants in the chat earlier. So... <laughs> Please uh, apply to the job. And um, Emma, what about uh, Gourmet? I know you have a lot of PhDs internally. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, for Gourmet, it's like for insects. In fact, uh, right now we are really focusing on the factory uh, and on the um, 
QC, QA, so to launch our project really soon. So for the R&D, yeah, we are not currently hiring, but uh, it can change like uh, maybe next year, like beginning of next year. Uh, yeah, so don't hesitate to look uh, often because in startup it can also evolve really quickly and suddenly we have a, a need. Uh, so don't hesitate to look uh, every, I don't know, two, three months uh, to look back if you didn't see anything interesting for you. And also maybe in other departments, because uh, uh, mm. I, for instance, quality control uh, method development. Yeah. We see a lot of PhDs on that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and I, we have a question about the, the older, the seasoned PhD, <laughs> the more experienced PhD. Uh, so, Lorena, you kind of answered on that, that uh, uh, they are a bit everywhere at Insect, but uh, for, for, for gourmet and, uh, uh, and neoplants, uh, what is the composition of the, the current team? Do, do you have PhDs in uh, business development, in IP, whatever? <laughs> Uh, so I just want to uh, answer about that because in my case, like I was an older PhD when I joined Neoplant. So I've joined Neoplant after four postdocs. So it's not like uh, I was directly fresh out, uh, out of my PhD and it didn't uh, bother me at all. And it was uh, actually one of the first time where I felt my experience valorized. And uh, that's why um, the founders team found me on LinkedIn and it was the thing they looked for. So that's uh, about the hiring uh, for uh, at Neoplants, um, the IP, the legal are externalized, but uh, the lawyers and we are working with have their uh, the PhD on their own, but we don't have this department yet uh, at Neoplants. Okay, Alison would like to know what about all like 56 years old? Well, uh, I don't know if you want to comment uh, on that, but uh, can, I can also if you want. So 56 for me, we have one in the company, but it's uh, really a senior uh, that has a lot of experience in industry before. And it, it's, it plays more like a consultant role. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think we will hire like uh, someone 56 as a team lead or, or if he has a really specific experience that we are looking for, that is very valuable, why not? <laughs> I was about to, to tell you, Alison, well, try it. You really have to promote your experience so, so that we see that uh, it's valuable uh, uh, in terms of expertise, but also in terms of maturity of maybe project or team management or whatever you you, you are good at and you, you enjoy. But we need diversity within teams. So... So it's also, I mean, it comes with uh, international profile. I saw that there is a question about language. Uh, it comes with uh, with men and women. It comes with uh, the, the, the age. It comes with uh, disabled people, with diversity. And Donna could make it at least... Uh, after a lot of experience, so uh, what was uh, I don't know if you if you had the impression that it well and Lorena also you had a couple of experience also before joining Insect. Uh, uh, do you consider it was difficult to make this transition? Do you think you had to to like uh, argue a lot to, to to say no? I will be able to make this switch, or it was natural for 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 your companies? Uh, from from my side, um, I think it was not easy. I will uh, not say difficult, but it was not easy. Uh, because at first, I think I was trying to find, uh, I had in mind a couple of companies that are like big companies that I say, ah, yeah, it's my dream to work in these kind of companies. I'm an enzymologist, so I wanted to work at Novozymes. 
and uh, it was uh, each time I saw like a, a, a job, I postulated, but but I never heard back. So uh, at one point, and it was a little bit more by I don't know how to say it, by by chance, I got into um, there was a web page uh, Euraccess, I think it's called. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, offers on PhDs and postdocs, but there I found something that that clicked immediately and was the insect offer. And I think that startups, it's a well, it's a place that it's a little bit more easy to start, let's say, because um, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, they uh, also are recruiting uh, people that that maybe just uh, graduated, um, and they are very. I think they are more open, uh, let's say, to to accepting uh, people just like just coming out from from the academics. So uh, I think that could be a, a nice way to transition, and after that, uh, yeah, maybe uh, search for something else if you really want like to be in a big corporate group or not. But I think the startups are. Uh, Nice place to start as well. Yeah, I mean, they are deep tech startups, so the the value proposition, their technology come from academia, so it's in their blood, it's in their DNA as well. So I mean, they are, all your companies are really familiar with what a PhD is, and and they collaborate a lot with academia as well. So, so sometimes it's also uh, this uh, imposter syndrome we have it, but it's a no question for, for the recruiter how, how long you spent into academia. If you can show that you really want to make the transition, because what they are somehow afraid of, in my point of view, is, okay, she is or is someone who can't find any more uh, opportunities opportunities in academia, but uh, he doesn't really want to to switch, and he will be unhappy. Uh, we we have a, um, Nora who would like to to ask a question, and if you if you want to to speak. Hi everyone. Um, Hi. I actually have several questions, so I'll probably ask just one or two for now and then see if I can ask more later. Um, so um, I guess because we were talking about diversity, I was thinking in terms of the, uh, like gender diversity, I see today we are all women, uh, at least in uh, the uh, as a keynote speakers. Um, I was thinking, do you think it has equal opportunities for men and women in the, in in this field, uh, because in in from my uh, from what I see, most people I know that uh, went outside of academia and succeeded are men, and uh, most women that tried um, uh, to convert to like to industry, especially consulting jobs, they quit because it's too long hours and they cannot focus on their family anymore and stuff like that. So I was wondering what you think about it. So could you, could you comment about the the work and and life balance in your your companies? Would like to do so. Well, I think uh, in insect, uh, well, it depends in the company and in the country, of course. Uh, but I, I feel that in the industry, it's it's easier to uh, match or well, to have a more equilibrated life in that sense. At least for me, I remember that as a PhD, I sometimes stayed very uh, late in the lab trying to get the experiment done or even went to uh, this on Saturdays and everything. And at least in, in France, uh, it's very well regulated. For You cannot... You cannot go uh, to the company on Saturdays, for example. You need a special permission. Uh, well, of course, you don't have like a job like a nine to six. Sometimes you start earlier. Sometimes you start uh, you finish after. But I think it's for me it was in that case easier to uh, coordinate uh, these two parts of of life because uh, yeah, yes, any other employer you as you are as any other employer that you are. 
subjected to the same laws and rights than everyone else. Do, do you want to make a comment about the the opportunities open to women and men? Uh, well, for for our, my case, what I see in the company is that it's uh, pretty equilibrated. Uh, they are making efforts in in that sense. Do you want to comment, Emma? Or... Yeah, for me, I have uh, the exact same experience as Lorena. Uh, I think my work-life balance is much better right now than during my PhD, for sure. And for the um, equality, I think it's pretty, it's it's even, sometimes you, we are like, ah, we want to hire a man because we are too many women. But for consultants, we have a lot too, and most of them are women, I think. So I don't have this impression, at least at Gourmet. And in terms of evolution as well, because there's the the balance yeah. between gender, but also the, the the evolution in career towards manager yeah. position. Yeah, I think the team lead it's uh, really uh, half of them women, half of them men. Yeah, even in the like uh, high management, uh, it's two men, one woman. Uh, no, it's really equilibrated. Okay. Um. I, I checked the chat and there was a question about uh, language requirements. So is it possible to work in your companies uh, without speaking French, for instance? Uh, in which position and so on? I, I think the answer will be rather short, but... <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, maybe I can take this one. At Neoplant, our uh, working language is English. Uh, we have uh, almost, uh, I don't know, 20 to 30 percent of the team who doesn't speak French at all, and uh, we arrange like French courses so we can can they can be integrated in their country in in better ways. So, uh, but uh, for work to work at Neoplans, uh, the English is the required language, and uh, they are in uh, in all the positions. So we have in the leadership team and uh, in all levels in the company. Same for you, Lorena and Emma, or not? Yes, uh, kind of. At first it was mostly English and now it has transitioned more into French. Um, but for yeah, for the, the big, big meetings, it's in English. Uh, we have as, as, uh, as well uh, a lot of people from a lot of places uh, in the world. So that is nice as well. And us, it's English 100%. And in fact, uh, people that don't really speak English really struggle. So it's quite the opposite. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it's yeah, it's what I see also uh, when when we assist company I wing the their talents. English is more important than French. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, do we have other questions that we should address now or sh can we maybe move on? I'm checking. Um, is it risky? Is it really risky? I'm not sure. Uh, it was probably a comment about something you you said, <laughs> and uh, so Alison, if you want to comment on your question, uh, but is it very risky, right? Uh, because I'm not sure to understand it properly. It was probably a comment on something that we said before. Hi, right. may I yeah. you hear me? Hi. Yes, we do. Yeah, are you? Or okay, it's me. Um, yeah, I think a startup company is very risky in the sense that I did work in a company for a while that had to change their platform to do something completely different. So there is a risk when you do this. So you didn't talk about the risk that you took, which I think must have been a big one. So felicitation, it's super, it's great. And the other question I have is how much travel do you have to do? And what about kids? And again, you're talking about women. So what about, um, you know, eventually you're going to have kids, eventually this. Again, I'm the 56-year-old who was wondering about why I wasn't hired at Gourmet. But um, anyway, it's, it's not a problem. But I just want to know, like, you know, <laughs> 
How does that work exactly for you as women? That's what I would like to know because I tried it once and it didn't work out for me. So I'd like to know the secret sauce that made it work for you. Thank you. Is there a secret sauce? <laughs> so I, 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 I would love her to say something. I'm a mom of two. So I have two daughters. Uh, they are 12 and 9 years old, and I've got one of them during my PhD, and uh, my other one I got her during my postdoc, and like uh, they are one of the strengths in my life. Uh, considering the risk, um, for me it's something like I loved it because like you are working for a purpose, and you will be ultimately seeing the result of your work. So you work good enough, hard enough, smart enough. The startup will resist long enough. And it's in this in a way the same thing as publish or perish that we had in academia. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that it's riskier than that. Yes, but do they ask you? I mean, you said you don't have to work on the weekends, but you never felt the pressure to answer well, your phone. Actually, I do work on weekends. So for me, my uh, my but it was my choice. Like I I kept the same rhythm as when I was in academia. But it wasn't like something enforced. So we have like the French law that the company must respect in any way. And they, I, I negotiated for a bit of freedom in my contract so I can still explore as I was doing in academia. So for me, that was the trade-off I made to be able to join a startup. Um, and about, just sorry to monopolize this conversation, but when you're an older person and have spent your whole life doing academia, but you've had other experience and dabbled in different things, I wonder how much, like, what would someone like me need to do to prove to you that I'm able to do the job that you're looking for? Because you talked about doing QPCR or doing this. Okay, been there, done that, know that. But what would you recommend for an older candidate who still wants to be viable and work in a company in, in green tech and is really ambitious and wants to do something, even if they're older women? What would you recommend to do? Oh. Like I, I, I don't like it's because the the question is very um, focused on older women, and that's 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 now how we review the application, at least in my company. But it so, must be um, part of it, the it, So uh, the, what we will review is your expertise and how of a fit is it with what we are asking to do. But the really? gender and the age will will not like be considered. Really? Uh, we ju we just hired a head of R and D that's uh, working, and he's like fifty plus. So um, I I don't know what to what to say to uh, to be. So I think it's possible if you really want it, and it's an actual fit between um, the person and the company. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's a company that checks the gender, the age, and choose to hire or not to hire based on that, do we you don't really want to go it. there? So. Okay, thank you. Maybe I should just not put my age in my CV then. Is that mm. something that you should do then? Maybe just not put your age or gender in the CV? I, I put them so I uh, people who discriminate doesn't choose me. So that's my way to get rid of um, <laughs> discrimination. Jerks. Okay, got it. Thank you. I, actually, you, do, you don't have to. It's not a compulsory to put your age oh, in no, your CV. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of other questions. Nora, you had another one. Uh, I think you were the first one on the list. Hi again. Uh, so I was wondering. Uh, so I'm a. Uh, so I have a PhD and I've done a couple of postdocs uh, that are, is now ending, and I'm about to apply to positions uh, both in academia and industry and. Uh, pretty much anywhere I can uh, that I find exciting. Um, I was wondering, do you think that lacking a first industry experience uh, can be an issue to get a job or even an interview? And what would you recommend uh, to do to improve uh, chances of being uh, interviewed or hired? Who would like to take this one? So I have seen that. Sorry, Amanda. No, no, go ahead. I can just talk about my boss experience. For example, he did uh, many postdocs and then he was, uh, I mean, I feel like in Gourmet, for example, uh, 
postdocs are very valued that if you do many postdocs, you have a lot of experience and you can go directly to a team lead position. So instead of uh, working as a scientist or engineer. So I, I had the same feeling like when I was doing a PhD that uh, a lot of people are telling me uh, if you do a lot of postdocs, if you have a lot of experience in academia, then it's super difficult to enter into industry. I have the feeling like it's true for big, big companies, uh, but for startup, it's not at all a question. Uh, at least at Gourmet, when we are looking for specific, uh, when we are looking for expertise, I mean, we are reviewing everyone. Uh, and uh, just to answer another question, we are not only looking for PhD, but also technician, engineer, uh, like we are also looking for a lot of uh, people that don't have PhD. Just to answer the question. Yeah, if I just may add, sorry, uh, uh, it's just that uh, when you're applying, you'll probably compete with people that have an experience in the industry, and although you have several postdocs, you have you don't have this experience. So what I mean is like, how do you compete with people that have an experience in industry? So from my experience, when I see all the people are praying, there is not a lot uh, from industry, in fact. Like, it's very, very rare. So we have a lot of applicants from academia. Uh, and it's just basically the experience that you have. It's not, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't think at least at Gourmet that we really want someone that comes from industry. Not at all. It's really more like the fit, if you get along, what your experience is. I hope it answers your question. <laughs> so the, yeah, yeah, just, I, I, thank you. Maybe just to, to add a few things for the, the people. One advice that we share with people that we guide is that even if you if you don't have uh, this uh, experience, uh, uh, the idea is always to try to um, uh, to fill the gap between your profile and the requirements of the, the company. And uh, it's something that we try to work with you during the current guidance program to help you to develop the, the arguments that could uh, convince that you actually can do the job, whatever you, the profile you, you have. Yeah, at least for R&D position, most of the time, uh, it, it's, it doesn't make a huge gap in your CV not having this uh, industry experience. It's It could be different, for instance, when we see that both uh, Donna and Lorena's uh, company are currently launching their factory and so on, and that a lot of scale-up uh, issue, in, so industrialization, manufacturing, and so on. For, for those, it, the, the answer might be different because it's really a, a, uh, setting up the, the manufacturing, but uh, uh, Julie, did uh, did Emma answer your question, or do you have one more? Uh, because I know that in the chat you had you had this question about engineers. She answered a little bit, but uh, okay. Is it difficult, more difficult to 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 have a job in industry without a PhD? Because I heard a lot of. Uh, about a PhD, a lot of people uh, that uh, have a PhD and apply in industry, and it's the same in academia. With without PhD, uh, I, I I feel like uh, I, I'm not um, I don't have enough uh, experience and everything to to be equal with people uh, with a PhD. So I'm a little afraid about that, and that's all. <laughs> if uh, maybe I can have a, uh, an answer more, I don't know. I finish. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, Would I you think like it to really yeah, depends on, on the job. Uh, as uh, Emma, I think, was saying, uh, the companies are recruiting uh, PhDs, they're recruiting uh, technicians only with a license. Um, they're recruiting a lot of engineers as well, like only with uh, the, the engineer or the master. 
So it really depends on, on the, the characteristics of the of the job uh, that that uh, that the company wants. So I don't think you should be afraid if you want to to explore and to go to transition only with uh, well only with <laughs> engineering uh, title. I think it's uh, completely uh, okay, and uh, I'm sure you will find uh, something. Uh, engineers are also very valuable. Uh, for the companies. So just to give you a number, in my team we are seven and there is only two PhD. So we recruit a lot of engineers, technicians, and uh, recently we were like, we need engineers, we need technicians. So don't hesitate really to apply. And even if it's an offer asking for PhD or three years of experience, if you have the expertise, uh, we can totally look at your CV and say, oh, maybe we will change our mind, take her because she has this expertise and we will change the, the strategy of hiring. So really don't hesitate to apply. The skills yes. and the person more than the diploma. I mean, and it's really true also for PhDs. When I asked them about their PhD, it was really in the sense of the the skills they they could develop and they they now use in their current job. We we haven't discussed yet about uh, the the green biotech sector. So well, my my first question for the three of you will be: Did you choose this sector on purpose, or was it like just the opportunity? But for you, uh, like you could uh, have done any sector linked to to life life sciences. Um, do you have the impression that um, early stage researchers are familiar with your sector? Also, um, we we always hear about the drug development uh, and and the pharma and biotech linked to to human health. Um, and what opportunities should they see in the sector if you see some that are emerging and will, will require a lot of PhDs? So it's a big question. <laughs> you can take it the way you want and answer a part of it each of you. You have three hours. <laughs> Uh, so as a as a structural biologist by training, I was like expected to go to a, the pharma group where we design for the drug design. Like it was the the way for biochemists if they want to join industry, it's the way to go. Uh, so when I get the uh, the first interaction with Neoplant, uh, one of the things that made made me make this move to uh, private sector or to industry is that they are working on a climate and not drug discovery and uh, where I can use my biochemistry expertise for, uh, to have a, an impact on the climate. And uh, that's how that transition happened to me. So yeah, the fact that it is a green sack made me make the move from um, academia to industry. So it was, it makes sense for you. Really, it was yeah. a question of having an impact. Uh, uh, on the climate, yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, for, for, for me, it was kind of similar. I didn't want to go to pharma at one point because I, um, well, for several reasons, but one of them was that in pharma, I think uh, to launch something, it has to pass, I don't know, 15, uh, 20 years. So uh, I wanted to have something uh, that, that, um, that that uh, that I was uh, contributing at least the feeling of contributing to something, um, let's say quicker. So if you launch, uh, let's say, an ingredient, uh, it takes us I don't know. It depends uh, one uh, to five years, something like that that like that. So that was one of the points that draw me uh, to uh, the the agro industry and the food systems. And that it also uh, this this uh, industry it's uh, evolving very quickly, like all the time, and there is uh, plenty of challenges, and you have to come up with new solutions. And I think that was the 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 other thing that that uh, convinced me about uh, at least for me for agro industry to go there to to this uh, part of green biotech and new noble sources of of ingredients and proteins. 
And for you, Emma? Yeah, and for me, uh, so during my PhD, I really wanted to go to industry and I didn't want to join pharma, <laughs> like you, Lorena. I wanted to, and I was really interested in uh, green biotech for, for sure. Uh, but I, I had some idea about projects, but I never heard about uh, cultivated meat before. It's really uh, looking at the PhD talent, for example, website that I saw, I saw the offer and I got interested. Or on LinkedIn, you can find a startup company, Green Biotech. So, but for me, it was clear that I wanted to join a Green Biotech uh, right after my PhD. Okay. Okay. We, we have a question in the chat about uh, reducing dioxide and methane emissions well i mean today biotech are used for many purposes including uh, waste treatment including uh, pollution of air but we have one example in, so yes yeah, so also uh, aspects on 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 which we we can think of definitely uh, and so were you familiar with, with the green biotech sector a couple of years ago when you joined it or because it's more and more popular but uh, oh. um hi it's me again yeah hi <laughs> hi hi uh, yes yeah, no, it's just there's companies also that are startup entrepreneurial venture companies that are working on using microbes to you know, uh, doing synthetic biology, as you mentioned. So I was listening very carefully to what you said in your beginning talk. And um, I mean, you can't cover everything, huh? but I was wondering if you, as your talent manager, your adapt, like, do you work with venture companies to support them on this type of project? Like, for example, cows that <laughs> release too much methane gas. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I understood your question. So, especially on methane, no. Uh, but I know there are, there is a startup in Germany working on that uh, between Germany and the Netherlands, to be. To, uh, and and yeah, in, in fact, one of the main difficulty I, I I think for for you uh, as potential uh, applicants is to identify uh, because it's a lot of really small deep tech startup and and it's also when they are uh, at the uh, really early stage that you will also see that it's really connected to academia and i think with what you shared with us before uh, this is something that would be reassuring for you to feel at ease making a, again this transition so i guess a early stage company could be a good match for you uh except that it's very risky my comment before was it's very risky isn't it because if you're an entrepreneurial in france what about your retirement again being older i think about that if you decide to go into a venture company be your own boss which is another option to go it's a whole other subject it's a whole other maybe conversation but that's even more risky, right? But you you have your own company. You started that, you said. So it's quite risky. So what do you recommend for somebody who doesn't know anything about business, who doesn't know anything about that, that's only an academic researcher for most of her life? I mean, it's it's a risky proposition, but very attractive, but still risky. You know, the, 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 the risk of losing your job nowadays is not much more risky to, to start up and SMEs rather than in large company when we see the the, um, the layoff uh, in the United States, for instance. It's yeah. really huge in very like GAFA and big, big companies now. So um, I'm not so sure. Think about what you will develop and how how bankable it will be for your CV after also, I mean, uh, and, and, and the risk is not so high, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
and I don't want to keep the flow flow too much. Uh, and, and, and do you think you, you have other comment to make about my question about the, the type of opportunities and things you're seeing in the green biotech sector? Maybe also technologies that you see having a huge impact. Um, I think I'd like to know which which ones would you focus? I mean, which ones? I mean, I think it's not a magic bullet, right? So there's so many different ways that with different expertises we can tackle this. I'm very interested in in green tech. Um, but my my background is in yeast genetics, for example, molecular biology, synthetic biology, and so on. And I'm just wondering how to transfer those skills to a company that would be meaningful, that would do something really meaningful and translate those skills to something meaningful now. And for me, that's that's hard. That's hard, you know. To it's hard for me to choose, for example, like what what particular green tech company would be the best for me. That's it. Who would like to comment on this one, Lorena? Well, sometimes we can have another approach. So you check at what it's out there. What's the offer? And sometimes you can be inspired because maybe you didn't think about the possibility to working for X company or X project. And then you see uh, you see the what it requires, what the mission is, and you see a fit and then you 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 can also apply. So sometimes we are thinking ourselves, yeah, I want this ideal job with this, this, this. And um, you can find it. Of course, but sometimes it's good to just see what it's out there and you you might get a, a match. So it's another possibility. Uh, another comment, Emma or Donna? No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say it's about the skill set. So if, uh, we, if it's a uh, uh, the skill set and the fit for that job more than the company, unless uh, unless like you don't want to work with the pharma, so you eliminate pharma groups. But uh, in the in the universe of the green tech, um, uh, molecular biology, yeast, uh, everything is very useful, and it's very useful at several steps and in different type of companies. Like at Neoplans, we use molecular biology. At Gourmet, I assume you use molecular biology, and like and it's useful for a lot of things. So. Um, so it's about uh, mainly the skill set, and I think that's uh, the way the hiring works. So we are looking for specific skills that we need to bring to the company. So if there is a fit between the candidate and the uh, and its skills and what we need, that's how the hiring works, at least at Neoplans. Nora, you have one more question, and then one from Alessandro just after. Hi. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, we're talking a lot about smaller biotechs, but like, what about bigger companies that are in the same uh, sector? Like, how do you think they value PhDs? And also, because um, in, in my experience, I've always done my studies or my work in bigger institutes with a lot of collaborators, a lot of people, and I really like that. And I don't know if I would be as happy in a really small company with working with five people. Maybe it's better for some people, and uh, but uh, for other, maybe you want to have um, just more connection. I don't know um, if you can comment on that because you're not obviously working in a bigger company, but um you made i guess the choice of working in a smaller company just before i give you the the, the floor just to comment nora in fact it's because the green biotech sector as a sector uh, it's rather emerging and and it's a lot of small startup and large company at one point will decide to acquire them on they have taken the risk uh, but uh, yeah, for like for real green biotech, most of the, the sector is is uh, was a small company, and if, when we see the companies of uh, of Lorena, for instance, it's uh, 
large one for me now. Uh, so how is it to work in a small company then, Lorena, Emma, Donna? A small or not that small, but. So do you mean you want to work like more, that more with more than five people in your team or like you want like a team of 10 in your subjects or you want to collaborate more with other teams? Both. Both? <laughs> <laughs> so for me, um, we are like seven in our, my team and we collaborate, of course, between us, but we collaborate a lot with other teams because everything is linked. So we collaborate with IP, with regulation, with QCQA, uh, food science even, so scale up a lot, we scale up bioprocess, so we collaborate. I mean, it's really a teamwork as a company, uh, but it's true that if you want more in a team, uh, yes, it's, it's a bit too early. <laughs> I think Lorena. it's a different, a different dynamic when you are in a small company because you, for instance, you know each other. Um, you're everyone. It's like in the same, located in the same place, and is uh, you are growing as a company. Now you have different sites. So, for instance, now we have something in the U.S., in the Netherlands, um, some different parts in 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 France. So the the interactions are different. Um, it's not better or worse, but it's uh, different. You get a little bit more specialized because when you are in uh, small companies, you have to do a lot of things. Um, and when you're getting bigger, you are getting a specialized, more specialized uh, in, in some tasks. Um, what I have seen of people that, that go, let's say, immediately from their studies to uh, big companies, uh, sometimes they... They do, I don't know how it's in other countries, but in France, they do something like called alternance. So, or you do like your PhD um, doing a project in a company. And uh, sometimes uh, people after their studies, they are taken by, by the company to, to work uh, with them. Um, also, and it's important like the connections at one point that you have. So if you can start doing some networking that can help if you want to, to go into the big groups. But from my experience, it was difficult to, to get into these big groups uh, at first. And, uh, and that's why I think uh, the three of us that are here talking, it was easier to do it uh, in, a, in a small company in the, in the green biotech. And as Amandine was saying, this sector is pretty new. So uh, you will have a lot of uh, small companies out there. Of course, there are the big ones that are doing also some some uh, green biotech activities. But yeah, the, the world is filled of the of the small ones for for now that are growing. <laughs> Any comment, Donna? Or no specific? Comment? Okay, it's the same. And, and well, I will just add one not notion that you haven't mentioned, uh, but. Uh, startups they never work alone. They have a lot of partners, academic one, other startup, uh, consultancy, uh, CROs, and so on. So uh, you have many different interactions <laughs> externally as well. So Alessandro, you had a uh, question. Uh, yeah. Um, so first, thanks for for sharing your experiences. And um, my question is a bit more abstract. Uh, let me try to to make sense. Um, so it's it's not necessarily about the, the green biotech sector, but um, so as far as, as I understand, when you go from academia to to industry, you have your core skills and then you have your transferable skills. So what if I don't want to use my core skills? If I only want to use my transferable skills because I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit sick of <laughs> what I did uh, in academia. Is that possible, or do you always need to mix in your heart, uh, your heart core? Do now, do now, would you like to pick this one? It would be a tough one to answer. Oh my God. Oh my God. The lowest. The lowest. Are you able to hear me now? Okay. 
So it will be hard for me to answer that question because um, usually when we are hiring, especially in the R&D at our stage of growth at Neoplant now, uh, we are hiring for the core skills um, that you, the people have learned in their, during their studies. Um, so I don't know how, uh, how to answer that uh, and um, maybe look for some roles as project management. But you need to apply some, learn some te project management techniques, so you will really understand the science part of things, and you're able to coordinate between different teams. I would assume that's a one way to use your scientific background without using your core skills. But I am not sure. Maybe Marion is a better help than me. That one. I would say that the the, the most important uh, thing is to for, for I guess for everyone like to know uh, very well what what do you want to do what would you love to do uh, and then it's uh, something like we 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 work in our current guidance program to uh, to try to to help you to reach the the goal that you have. Um, so I, I, so would I would say. Yeah, it's not uh, the the idea is to reflect about the skills that you really enjoy and want to um, to develop in um, in your professional life. Uh, okay, okay, I can work with that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can help you with this, but I totally sw switch um, projects from my PhD to my uh, to what I do what in I do. startup. So if you mean. I mean, core skills, it's, yeah, it's the technique you have it, but you can apply it to any subject, like any project. It can, like I was working on mitochondria before, and now I'm working on stem cells. So it's a totally different project. Okay, okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. I'll think about it's, it. It's <laughs> a, I have an echo. And, um, it's a mix. It, it can't be only your core skills. It's a lot about your uh, transversal skills as well and your motivation the fit with the team and especially in sector in which the values and the impact matters uh, uh, I, I think you can make a difference through your real motivation like the real one not the fake one, fake that, one you, that you we, yeah we exactly become. because that's what uh, this green biotech is uh, or green technology is about at the moment right a lot of people are motivated to do something but maybe they don't have the right skill sets to fit in exactly the positions that are promoted that, that was my question about. yeah but yeah but the, the good skills is skills not only do you have the those techniques and those techniques, and those techniques. techniques. Yeah. right could you, could you turn, turn up your, your, your microphone, microphone. Uh, sorry is there's a strong echo when your microphone is on. Okay, it's much better. Uh, the, when we are discussing about the match between your profile and the need of a, a green biotech company, it's not only in terms of technical skills, right? Uh, Emma and Lorena were saying also could be project management. It could be other things. And uh, it's also your mindset to join the startup. And uh, if you don't match everything uh, it's normal if you don't match much uh, my advice would be to try to meet them to convince them that you will do what's needed to to learn what you don't have <laughs> um, uh, thanks just i'm just seeing that uh, it's almost the end of yeah, the, I know. this round table so, okay <laughs> I know there's a really uh, this is one question that um, maybe you will be able to answer first. Are your companies committed to green practices, sustainable practices internally? Yes, I think it's in the core of uh, the, the values. What we do, in the core of the values, the sustainability part. Uh, so you, that in, in that short, it's yes, consistent. It's consistent with what same for for Emma and Donna. Yes. Same. Okay. Okay. Uh, perfect. Uh, the question came twice. Uh, and to end up with, since we only have like one more minute, what would be your last tip 
or something we haven't uh, discussed yet and you you feel it's important to share this with the the, the audience i would say be confident <laughs> you have the skills you have a lot to bring be confident on your skills of what you know i mean you you do, for me you don't uh, have less than someone that comes from industry so apply <laughs> Donna? Uh, uh, one thing that helped me, and I think I mentioned during uh, the introduction, is uh, the reflection I have done when I was at Pasteur with the mask helped me like focus on what I really like and what I don't like instead of seeking what is available or not available. And uh, this like helped to guide my choices. So I think it's uh, a great chance to have um, the mask available. So I would like highly advise to go there. So just advertising for you, Mario. Thank you, thank you, Dana. I was about to thank you for the for this. <laughs> and for those who are not uh, internal uh, fellows of the the Pasteur Institute, there are also the options uh, to 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 get guidance. Lorena, what would be your last tip? Yeah, maybe on the same line as, as Emma, like don't be afraid. Uh, if you really want to to explore, to make the transition. Um, and start applying uh, and uh, maybe your profile won't fix one fits like 100% with what it's written in the publication of the offer but that doesn't matter you, you go and uh, and uh, maybe yeah there's there's uh, the chances for you to get picked let's say that, well that's it. We, we need to end up uh, the, the roundtable. Thanks a lot for attending the roundtable. Thanks a lot for sharing your experience, uh, Emma, Lorena, and Donna. Uh, thanks to, the, to, to Marion and the team for, for the organization also. Uh, please feel free to connect with us. You have uh, the, the, the LinkedIn profile and so on in the chat. And we hope it was useful. <laughs> For, for all of you, and we wish you the best for the next steps of your career. Thank you very much, uh, Amandine, for uh, the moderation and for uh, thank you to, to all of us, and also thank you to the participants for the the uh, very interesting questions. And uh, yes, we uh, I'm full I'm in the same. Uh, uh, ID, I really uh, hope you uh, hope all the best for you for your next step of your career, and uh, maybe see you soon at the at the mask or in the campus. I don't know, uh, and maybe in the mask events that the text mask event that we organize, maybe you'd be uh, um, again our guests. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I will. Thank end, you. Uh,